Hi guys, my name's Eva and I'm going to be talking about surgical wound management today. And disclaimer that I've not had a plastics job at all, but I'm, I'm just going to be talking about how to approach post-op um, surgical wounds as a junior, just on a general surgical ward. So in order to understand how to manage a post-op wound, it's important to think about wound healing. And the main types are primary and secondary tension. Primary is what we deal with most of the time, which is where the wound edges have been brought together, often by suture or clips, um, for example. Um, and secondary intention is where the wound is left open to, hit, to heal and it heals from the bottom up. The main difference, I'd say, is kind of the outcomes with both. Primary is often pre preferred because it creates a prettier, um, less visible, smaller scar, whereas secondary intention can leave a bulkier, more obvious scar. But there's various different various um, reasons why you would choose one or the other. Um, these are the four um, stages of wound healing, which I won't go into, but are important to understand as well. And then the main thing I kind of want to talk about in this bit is the factors affecting wound healing. So it's important to think about, does your patient have any of these um, when being asked to go and see them? Um, so age is a very big risk factor, um, combined with nutrition, which you don't often think about, but Say you've got an older person who's got very poor appetite, very poor um, nutrition, lack of protein and nutrients in their diet. Their, their ability to rebuild um, their body in general, but wounds, um, is going to be less than a young healthy person who eats normally. Comorbidities such as diabetes is a massive one. Um, always things like smoking as well, diabetes and smoking, very, very bad for wound healing. Um, and then local factors as well. So if you think about it, if you've got a wound in the anal region, it's going to be a lot dirtier than a wound on a forearm, for example. Um, so it's important to think about those things as well. So I'm just going to do a bit of a case. So you've been asked by a nurse to review the following patient. So it's a 75 year old lady. She came in a few days ago and sustained a right NOF, which is an echothema fracture. And now she's day three post a right hip hemiarthroplasty. Um, so it's been fixed, there's some letter work in there. And three days later, the nursing staff are concerned about her wound being a bit oozy. So looking at her notes um, and risk factors, which you've just spoken about, first of all, she's 75. Um, so that's a risk factor in itself. She's got mild cognitive impairment. If you think about it, if someone's confused, they may be trying to, you know, scratch the area, which might inflame it, or be trying to take a dressing off, which again would, you know, introduce infection to the area. She's got diabetes, which you've already covered as a risk factor. Atrial fibrillation on a Pixaban, so that would be important to think about um, from a bleeding point of view. And she's also got asthma. She's a non-smoker, so that's, that's good. And she has a clinical frailty score of 5. So frailty is often a marker for poor wound healing as well. Because of what I just mentioned about confusion, nutrition um, put together, all of that contributes to wound healing. You look at her op note, which in my opinion is one of the most important things to look at when you're seeing a post-op patient. You notice intraoperatively there was nothing significant really. Um, and on the post-op plan, um, it just says for a wound review at two weeks and trimming of sutures. And that's commonly what's used at my trust in um, trauma and orthopedics. Um, and two weeks is often a good mark to just try and keep that dressing on, keep um, the sterile environment um, preserved in order to promote wound healing. You really don't want to take the dressing off before that unless you have to, so unless it's completely soaked or you're worried about an infection. And your colleagues have seen um, this patient before over the last couple of days and they've not really had any concerns. Her bloods today show a mild drop in her HB, which you would allow postoperatively, and a slightly raised white cell count, which could be because she's just had an operation, but is also just important to keep in the back of your head, like, is this an early sign of infection? So you go and see her. She tells you she's feeling very well. It's progressing well with physios. She's got minimal pain or pain control and analgesia, and she's not feeling feverish or unwell. So these are her obs on the side. And then you do an A to E. So um, her airway's okay. You've not got any concerns about her chest. Her blood pressure's a smidge on the low side, but you notice she's had a blood pressure like that before. Um, she's generally euvolemic, although she's got some mild peripheral edema, which she had preoperatively. Um, and this is the most important bit here. So she's aporexial and looking at her dressing. So her dressing is intact, which is important. 
a marker as to how saturated it is, or even a drawing in the notes is sometimes useful. So 75% saturated with fresh red blood, there's no pussy discharge, and there's no redness, warmth, there's no cellulitic changes around the, the dressing in the wound. She's neurovascularly intact distally. Um, so at this point as well, with regards to the dressing, you could also mark it. So you could use a permanent marker to draw around the blood um, and mark um, time stamp it. So you put the date and the time so that when your colleague sees them in the future, they can tell if it's progressed past that. The other thing you could do is also upload a photo if you have uh, the systems in place at your hospital. Looking at her drug chart as well, her pick span was due to restart today, but it was being held perioperatively. And she has been having her low molecular weight, no molecular weight heparin at a prophylactic dose postoperatively. So at this point, you could do a VBG to reassure yourself, um, depending on how worried you are at this, uh, at, uh, with this patient. Um, her lactate's one, which is very reassuring, and she's not um, she's got a normal pH and a normal HB, or a slightly low HB. Um, and then this would be the plan that I would come up with. So we've already talked about marking the dressing and uploading a photo. Now you could apply pressure dressing. That would normally be my go-to. Um, there's a couple of ways you can do that. So if it's only bleeding, a little bit and you've only got a bit of the dressing saturated you could pop some gauze on top and then pop a dressing on top again and effectively that would just be, be applying some pressure and some compression to the area to stop the bleeding the other thing you could do if it's if it's bleeding quite a lot and you're gonna have to change the dressing anyway is you could do a similar thing but but underneath directly onto the wound you'd have to use a sterile aseptic non-touch technique um, to do this because obviously you don't want to be introducing infection you could just pop lots of gauze and then a fresh dressing on top and monitor it that way. There are lots of different ways that different trusts do it. Um, often nursing staff and seniors are really good to ask if you're not sure. Seniors are also good to ask about from an um, anticoagulant point of view. So it's always difficult to know what to do, although you do can get a feel for it if you've done the job for a little while. So I would definitely hold her a pick span if she's bleeding onto her dressing. I would possibly give her her low molecular weight heparin, especially because she's got a clotting risk, which is her AF. Um, but if it's really bleeding, you can also stop that as long as you document her calves being soft and tender so that she's not got a DVT. Um, and then setting a time frame for a re-review is always a, always a good idea as well. Shows you you've got forward thinking. And I would maybe chat to my senior informally about this, but it depends how confident you are. You could always ask them to come and see it and advise you if you're not sure. Just going to quickly talk about some other management options so if she was presenting differently so if someone's hemodynamically unstable and they've they're literally gushing out blood from their wound then you would obviously do an a to e and give them blood or fluids as needed compression sometimes literally physically using your hands to compress um a bleeding site so from a wound is is what's needed whilst also putting out a major hemorrhage protocol that's the quickest way to get blood into someone and to get you know people hands to help if they are hemodynamically stable, but you are concerned there's quite a bit of blood loss, again, you would do your A to E and consider a red blood cell transfusion depending on their HB or if they're feeling symptomatic. And then you could go do various um, wound management um, options. I'm going to talk about it in a second, but you could think about negative pressure dressings. And then I would also always speak to my senior if they're bleeding quite significantly. Then this is the green zone, which I think our patient falls into, where you would just do basic wound management, such as monitoring or adding a compression um, dressing. And never forget a meds review. So negative pressure wound therapy is commonly used on the wards, and it's really clever because it increases blood supply to the area to encourage healing, but also removes all the extra blood and wound exudate. So most common on TNO, I'd say I've seen PICOs, and this is a little pump and basically, like I said, draws exudate from the dressing. When it's soaked, it does need changing. There'll be a little um, button flashing up here because if it's soaked, it can't work properly. And these could be applied to really oozy wounds. And then once they're starting, once for like 24, 48 hours, if they're starting to become dry, then you can switch them back to simple dressings. Vac dressings, I'd say, are more kind of senior lab management. Often they're applied in theatre. Um, and basically they do the same thing where they have um, a dressing and it sucks out wound exudate but it has a drain on the side and the drain needs to be emptied in order for the um, negative pressure to work so I've seen it before where the drain's been full and we've been wondering why the dressing here has been leaking and that's because it needs to be changed. Other considerations just quickly for uh, 
oozy wounds. Um, is that is this just normal post-op bleeding or is there a cause of the bleeding? So I've seen it before where um, the anastomosis um, has failed. So effectively you've got an artery that's been leaking and that's why a patient's been bleeding. Um, or is infection underlying and is that why it's not healing and it's bleeding or there's um, yellow ooze from it? Um, I would always do um, all these micro things, so swabs, blood cultures, chatting to micro. And it's important to think if someone's got metal work in there and they've, you're worried about infection, and that effectively that's a prosthetic joint infection. And that's a very serious infection which seniors and microbiology will be involved in. Sometimes you can also get seromas and hematomas underlying, um, causing oozy wounds, which can happen a few days post-op. But um, most often they kind of resolve themselves, although if they're very, very large, they can require drainage.